let me hear you say this. You're welcome. 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 Oh, my gracious, listen. This has just been wonderful. I am just blown away. Listen, this segment of our celebration uh, comes to allow you to get a peek on some private areas in my life. And uh, we have Deborah Terry Stevens, who will now come and take you on a journey with me. I'm going to be sharing some stories, some personal stories, some hurts, some pains, some joys, some moments in my ministry that helped make and shape me. So do me a favor, share this broadcast, invite someone to come on now and as we have a real conversation. And please, when you hear what I talk about, don't judge me, just pray for me. Come on, go with me right now. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. My name is Deborah Terry Stevens, and I am here with none other than the Bishop, Reverend, Dr. Sir Walter Lee Mack, Jr. That's a lot of names. <laughs> yeah. Sir Walter Lee Mack, yes. Jr. Yes. <laughs> Talk to me about Senior, that name. Talk to me about that name. <clears throat> well, it's, it's amazing because, you know, I have a very rich legacy mm -hmm. in ministry. My father was the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church here for 33 years. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I didn't want to go into ministry. I had seen his giant steps. And part of me um, didn't think that I would ever be able to measure up to that. And in some way, I still feel that I can never measure up to that. Um, but um, his name was given to him by his father in 1929 um, because his dad wanted him to always represent royalty and significance. And so during that time of the height of racism and Jim Crowism, et cetera, um, his dad put um, my granddaddy put sir on his name. And so for many years, I did not um, have that, that, that prefix onto my name. Um, my friends knew me by Walt, uh, Mac Attack, Big Mac, whatever they call me. <laughs> but it wasn't until I went to, um, uh, to Elon College mm that um, I was sitting in class and, and, um, and it came to me the racial implication of that name. I was sitting in class and the professor came in and uh, he was going down the road and I was the only African-American student in that class. And for everyone else, he just called the name. And, and then when he got to my name, he said, Sir Walter Mack, and I said, present. And then he said, what do you go by? And I said, Sir Walter Mack. And he said, okay, Walter. And I said, Sir Walter Mack. But it hit me that that was a racial implication. Because, you know, when you go back into the history of us, they've always been changing our names. Absolutely. Um, um, from, from Kunta to Toby. Come on. And then, you know, because whoever defines you um, also has control over you. And so at that point, I took on a different significance of that name and I, I was gonna always honor my father by maintaining that. And so that's what I've done. And I've tried to do that even in ministry to honor his name through my ministry for 30 years. And I pray to God that he would continue to allow me to do that. I love it. Talk about put some respect on my name, <laughs> Sir Walter Lee Mack yeah, Jr. Yeah. And not only are you honoring your earthly father, you're also honoring your heavenly father. Yes. The, the integrity of which you have, I've known you for over 20 years. I yes. mean, oh gosh, more than 20 years. That's right. Um, 
and just the integrity that I've seen you in ministry, it's remarkable. It's shocking that it's so remarkable. It shouldn't be that shocking. Wow. It should be the standard, but unfortunately it's not. But it's so nice that I know yes. and that Union is blessed to have someone who operates in such integrity in ministry because there are some characters out here. Yes. And we're so grateful to have people like you. So let me ask you this. When you were growing up, what did you want to be? So, so, because <laughs> I'm sure you probably didn't want to be a preacher. I did not want to be a preacher. <laughs> I did not want to be a preacher. And I had seen, you know, I want to preface this with something. And, and so we're having real talk here. And so I grew up in a great church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, Bunker Baptist Church. Um, those were great churches that helped shape and nurture me and my family. <clears throat> However, um, I had seen my father go through some hurt and through some, some um, pain um, from pastoring and pastoring. And I didn't want to, to go through all of that and, and at the end of the day still have to struggle. And so I went to school wanting to be in corporate um, the corporate world, the business world. So I actually majored in a mass communication and minding in business. And that was, I was trying to get into that corporate scene. And, um, and so I didn't want to go into preaching. But what happened was every angle of my life, it always led back to me leading people. You know, on the football field, you know, it was, okay, who's going to lead us in prayer? Mac, you pray. <laughs> um, when I got hurt in football, they wanted to start a church service at Elon. And they were like, okay, who's going to start a church service? Mac, you start the church service. <laughs> I mean, it was just always. Right, right. Um, I walked in the radio station at Elon College, and, and the guy says, hey, you interested in starting a radio? We have everything but a gospel station. Would you do gospel? So it was always leading me back to church. And, and so until I found the calling for myself, um, people were always pushing me. They was like, oh yeah, you're gonna be a preacher. You look like your daddy. You got a neck like your daddy's. You know, I, I wasn't into that. I didn't want to go into ministry for that. But that call came for me. Um, I was working at the Workforce Development Department not far from here. And, um, and I was supposed to be interviewing people, helping them get jobs, et cetera. And I knew that God was calling me when I was in an interview, getting up from the interview and going in the bathroom to read the Bible and coming back out and finishing the interview. I knew that God was tugging me to something greater. And so at that point, I surrendered. I remember talking to my mother and crying and weeping. And she knew exactly what that was. And so I surrendered that. And that's... And I'm so glad I did. I mean, I, it, it's, I would not wish this call on my best friend, but I would not take nothing in the world for it. It has not been easy, but it's been a great journey. It's been a great journey. Wow. And how old were you when you accepted the call? So I was um, 23 at the time. Yeah, I was 23 when I accepted the call in the ministry. And so I was young. <laughs> As they say, young, dumb, and full of bubblegum. <laughs> I was young, but, um, but I had some um, great people to help steer me. Um, Dr. John Mendez, when I first started preaching, um, I, I remember us downtown, and I sat with him at a downtown cafe, and, um, and I shared with him what God was doing. And at that time, he got so excited and he had iced tea on his side. And he got so excited that his iced tea ended up in my lap. Wow. <laughs> and um, and, and this, is a, this is a true story. So, so he said to me, you cannot preach in this pulpit until you go to church, until you go to school. And so I preached June 10th, 1990. And in August, I was at Duke University. And so that was, a, that was a stipulation for him to get me um, formal training, 
to be in ministry because his idea of ministry was that you really didn't have much to say until you proved yourself through training. Mm -hmm. And that's, and he was my pastor at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and so I quit my job and I went on faith and, um, and he went with me down there and, and everything worked out and, and um, God opened doors. And when I got there, I mean, when I was at Duke, the Lord opened so many doors that I probably only had one Sunday or two Sundays that I was there in seminary that I wasn't preaching somewhere. Wow. And so God just, you know, blessed that effort. But <clears throat> Dr. Mendez was very instrumental in that. And he, he really was serious about education and be getting prepared for that. So what was it like at Duke? Going, going from Elon College, a smaller university, to Duke. So, so one of the pieces that um, was very life-changing for me was prior to going to Duke, so between June 10th, 1990, and August of that same year, um, we witnessed the murder or the death of my godmother. Um, and uh, my mother was in the car with her. We were all at the beach. And the night before, we were all having Bible study at the beach. And she was a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, the Bible study at Emmanuel Baptist Church is now named the Delores Everett Bible Study. Oh, wow. And she was very faithful in picking up the members to go to Bible study every service. So she was a godmother of mine. And so she was with us on this trip. And initially, she didn't want to go. But she went with us. And we all had Bible study. And that night, she asked me a question. I just started preaching. And she said, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Mm. <laughs> and I kind of walked her through some scripture as much as I knew to try to explain to her why bad things happen to good people. And the next day, a, um, a brake drum off of an 18-wheeler truck exploded and flew through the windshield that her and my mother were riding in. And, and it, it, it literally, um, you know, um, decapitated her. And, and so... My car was behind her, and um, so I took off behind, after the car was hit, I took off in the woods behind her, and, and so I saw that. And I saw my mother sitting in the car. And, and to make a long story short, so I went to seminary with, with, with my faith shaken, and even questioning how could a good God Allow. allow something like this. And so many people don't know that I went in with some doubt. But it wasn't until I took a class in theodicy that that relationship between good and evil and how even in the midst of evil, God is still at work and that God is not necessarily responsible for evil but bad things happen, but at the end, God gets the glory in it that I was pulled back to my center. And that shaped my experience for preaching, for teaching, for understanding, for how I began to interpret my experience at Duke. And so, um, but I'm so glad that I came back to that center uh, because that was life changing for me. And, and, um, but it, it, was, it, was, it was a very powerful moment in experience. Wow. I mean, that is like, sort of like the bedrock of your, your spiritual formation. I mean, just. Absolutely. And that's why I think as a pastor, I can relate to the, the mother who loses a child. Mm -hmm. I can relate to the drug dealer who's out there trying to find a way and have probably have seen murders and, and all that's going on in his mind and he's wondering where is God in my life? I've been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People, you know, people come in these doors and they see this church and they see, they look at the paper and they see degrees, but they don't know that you've been there too, you know? And, and, and when you go through those things, you can identify 
And so you learn not to curse those moments, but you find God in those moments and you come out still giving him glory and you thank God that he didn't take his hand off of you. Come on. In the midst of that. And that he put people around you to remind you that God still has his hand on you because even in the midst of that, God was opening doors for me to preach my way through that. Mm. And I had to wrestle with my theology and, um, and still find God in the midst of it. So it's a powerful moment. Oh, wow. Amen. As people often say, they see your glory, yeah. but they don't know your story. They don't know it. They don't know it. And, and, and just to be able to, to, to rely on the fact that regardless of what I've gone through, what I'm going through, what I will go through, God is still there. Yes. He has his hand on I greet you with the joy of the Lord, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to say a word of affirmation and appreciation to my good friend, Bishop Sir Walter Lee Mack, Jr. There are several words that come to mind, generosity, loving, and caring, but I just want to spend a, about 30 seconds talking about innovation, because uh, Bishop Mack is one of the most creative persons I know. Sometimes we do not understand the depth of genius of persons who are close to us. Union Baptists, people of Winston-Salem, you have within your midst one who truly understands the word of God that says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Already it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? You have in your midst one who understands and who uh, embodies the word of revelation found in toward the end when it says that God says, I make a new heaven and a new earth. Behold, I make all things new. Pastor Walter Lee Mack, thank you for bringing newness into all of our lives in terms of how we read the scripture, in terms of how we practice ministry, in terms of how we live our lives, and in terms of how we express our love to people just like you. God be with you. Hello everyone, I'm Alan Joins, the mayor of the city of Winston-Salem, and it's my pleasure and honor to be a part of bringing you greetings as we stop to celebrate the life and contributions of Bishop Sir Walter Mack. The bishop has served his God, and he served this community in so many, many ways. I personally can attest to the work that he's done here in this community. For instance, he put together an amazing coalition of African American leaders, white leaders, and others to bring to the city a request, a demand, if you will, that the name of the Dixie Classic Fair be changed because of the offensive nature of that. This is just an example of how Dr. Mack has works behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the, the scenes to make things happen in our community. I'm proud to call him my friend, my mentor, and my advisor. He has helped me through many situations and gave, given me great advice for, for our community. So on behalf of our city, our 250,000 citizens, it's my pleasure to say congratulations, Dr. Mack. Thank you for what you mean to our community, and may I wish you many, many more years of service to God and to our community. Thank you. Every true gospel preacher is called of God. Like the Lord told Jeremiah, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, and I called you to be a spokesman for me before you were formed in your mother's womb. A real gospel preacher is called of God before they are formed in their mother's womb. Our pastor comes from a long line of gospel preachers. In fact, 
his grandfather pastored a church that we could walk to from right here about two streets over many, many years ago. They used to have services on Sunday afternoon. It was a storefront church. His father, the Reverend Dr. Walter Mack Sr., used to preach there on Sunday evenings. It was a neighborhood church. And the residences and the children, they would crowd the church out on Sunday evenings. There was gospel singing, there was prayer, and there was good gospel preaching. One of the main gospel preachers that they featured at that time was Reverend Sir Walter Mack, who was known at that time as a boy preacher because he was so young. And when he would preach on Sunday evening, they would just fill up the little storefront church. And he was so small because he was so young, he couldn't stand, you couldn't see him over the podium. And what they would do, they would take a soda pop crate and lay it down in front of the podium and he would stand up on it and he would preach the gospel. He was very popular as a gospel preacher, even when he was just a lad and he had a lot of influence. So our bishop comes from a good lineage of preachers. His father was a preacher, his grandfather was a preacher, and he had uncles that was a preacher. So preaching, gospel preaching, called of God, is in our bishop's DNA, and we're so glad about it. God bless you. I'm Uter Evans. Happy 30th anniversary to my friend, my former employee, Dr. Sir Walter Mack Jr., who I met at the age of 19 while he was a student at Elon University. He applied for a part-time job on Sundays that worked from 6 a.m. to noon, in which he played good gospel music, hosted local personalities with live shows, and played pre-recorded programmings like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Speaks and local churches who we aired at 11 o'clock. He was prompt, he was dependable, and he had great personality. So where he went from that point on was not a surprise to me because he demonstrated early on that he was dependable. He was a joy then and he continues to be one now after 30 years. Congratulations. To Bishop Sir Walter Mike, greetings in the name of Christ our King. All the way from the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas, I send greetings and love and appreciation and acknowledgement of 30 years of faithful service to the Master. I've enjoyed our interactions, our times of fellowship, our brief interactions and communications we've had one with another at critical moments and times along the way. And I am proud and honored to lift my voice to appreciate and celebrate 30 years in ministry. Continue to do what you do. Nobody can do what you do like you do it. May God smile upon you. May he bless you. May he give you fresh word and fresh manna and new books and new revelation and continue to feed the body of Christ because we are all blessed because of the 30 years you have given to our Lord and Savior. God bless you from the Potter's House. And again, happy anniversary. Isaiah 48 says, grass withers and flowers fade but the word of God will stand forever. Bishop Mack, I have watched you preach, teach, and live this word of God for 30 years. You embody the true essence of a preacher, a pastor, and a man of God. Your integrity, passion, leadership, scholarship is beyond measure. And you also inspire encourage and uplift so many others. So today I celebrate you as my pastor and my husband. Bishop Mack, you are one of a kind. I am grateful to God for you and so excited for your 30th anniversary. I'm here to support you, encourage you, and love you. 
as you continue to love, inspire, and encourage the people of God. Happy anniversary, Bishop Mack. I love you, sweetie. So Walt Ola, he's always, always been my boy. Yeah. And uh, you always loved church and you would go with your dad and to, uh, you'd be always with him when he would go. And the last time he went to Balkan before he died, uh, you went with him that morning because he wasn't feeling well and I asked you to ride along with him and we came on later. And, uh, and you drove him that day to Bonkham for the last service. And you were only 14 years old, but he let you drive. So when I heard that, I said, no, he really wasn't feeling good. So after he preached that 11 o'clock sermon, that's when he got sick, after. And so you drove him back, back home, and you were just his right hand, just like him. And you're just wonderful, wonderful. And since he's passed, uh, You've been just like father, son, whatever you want to call it, you've taken care of all of them. And you went out of the church saying, I'll take care of him, Dad, I'll take care of him. And you've done just that. You're just wonderful. We invite you to make a contribution to the ministry. Through your giving, we reach our community and expand his kingdom. And we recognize the one who gave us everything. To give, you can use technology. Use the Push app or go to giving page on the Union Baptist website. Use the Cash app. Dollar sign, UBC, 1200 trade. Use the Givelify app. Union Baptist Church, Winston-Salem. Let us show love through giving. 